Okay, hello and welcome. I am a disembodied voice in the ether and we are taking a look at how to approach questions in an A2 maths paper. So, let's get straight into it. Uh, question one, we have the equation for a curve uh, given x is greater than certain values. Show that the gradient of the curve is always negative. So ultimately, what we are looking for here is just how to differentiate. Um, and this is using your uh, words quotient rule. That's the that's what they call it, the quotient rule. I.e., how to differentiate your um, a fraction. And the way you do that is if you have a fraction u over v, and you differentiate it, you get uh, oh, I can't draw lines very easily. U prime V minus V prime U over V squared. That squared looks appalling, but there we go. That's your quotient rule. So if you differentiate where prime means it's been differentiated, so u prime is differentiated u. And so in this case, you apply that to your formula with u is 1 plus x, v is 1 plus 2x, and you will get your answer. And then you can plug in x is greater than minus a half to show that that's always going to be negative. Question two, solve the modulus equation 2, 3x minus 1 equals 3 to the x, giving your answers correct to three significant figures. So, two steps to this question. The first is to solve the modulus equation, and that we are going to do by treating 3 to the x as just a thing that we are solving for. So, essentially, we're going to be solving the modulus equation 2x minus 1 equals x. You can do this in two ways, either by squaring both sides of the equation, at which point it doesn't matter whether this is positive or negative, or by just putting the plus or minus in. Um, either way works, probably the squaring is nicest, um, but yes. So yeah, for instance, using for x minus 1 squared equals x squared. Solve that for values of x and then realize that what we have done is treated x as 3 to the x. And so then whatever you get, you'll get x equals two possible answers, a and b. Well, now you say, okay, well, 3 to the x equals a and b, and then you're using uh, logarithms to find the answer to that, uh, and your log formulae for converting from 3 to base 10 or base e logs. Or I think you can actually do a log to the base 3 on your calculator, so that's probably fine too. Okay, right. Um, only other thing to be careful of is if you are ever taking a log and one of your answers is negative, ignore that answer, because you can't take the log of a negative number. So be careful of that. All right, find the exact value of the integral of log x over root x dx. So how are we going to go about this? This is integration by parts. So integration by parts, you have your standard formula of the integral of u dv by dx dx oh come on please there we go is equal to u v minus the integral of v d u by dx dx please there we go and then when you're doing this with exact values, well, all you're doing up with your limits, 
obviously they're going as regular limits on the integrals and like you would have after you'd actually done the integration your uv goes in square brackets with the uh, limits at the top and bottom like you're used to doing um, the other trick to this is to recognize which of the parts so this is log x times x to the minus half right um, deciding which of these you want to integrate and which of them you want to differentiate uh, in this case it should be particularly clear because you don't know how to integrate log x so you want you need to be differentiating that one so that one needs to be u you can integrate x to the minus a half that's going to give you an x to the half and then you will end up with just a pure polynomial which you can then integrate again over here so yeah that one's fairly reasonable once it comes to things all right question four the parametric equations of a curve are as follows. Show that. So, key to this ultimately is the idea that d, it's the chain rule, dy by dx is equal to dy by dt, dt by dx. And this, dt by dx, is just how do we write? Yeah, dx by dt to the minus 1. It's 1 over dx by dt. You can do dx by dt and dy by dt with, a, with the product rule as usual and just put them in. And then I think you're going to have to... No, no, you won't even have to do that. Yeah, so that, that'll, be, that'll be fairly nice. Um, I think you'll have to do a trig identity to get to your tan at the end. Um, you'll probably have a, a sum on the top and bottom, but yeah. All right, so yeah, that seems fairly reasonable. Question five, prove that cot theta plus tan theta equals two cosec two theta. Uh, so this is a trig identity. Um, best way to do things that involve lots of these stuff is to write them all out explicitly. So cot theta is cos theta over sine theta, tan theta is sine theta over cos theta, and this is one uh, is two over sine of two theta. Uh, you can put your trig identities into various sides combine the two fractions on this side and eventually you will come out with what you're after. Um, it's probably easiest to work your way through from both sides and try and meet in the middle. Um, but yeah, so writing everything out explicitly in terms of just sine theta and cos theta and then doing your uh, identities from there. So also you want to turn your sine 2 theta into your uh, cos squared thetas in this case. Part two, hence show that this integral is this. So at that point, well, now you have cosec of two theta is a half cot theta plus tan theta. Um, and I suspect that you are then expected to know The integrals of cot theta and tan theta? Are you? That seems fairly harsh. Let me check the mark scheme for that. Uh... Yes, okay, fair enough. Uh, you are. So. Yeah. All right, so yeah, this one, it's just a matter of substituting the integral in and then using your integrals for cot theta and tan theta, uh, which apparently you are supposed to know. All right, question six. We have a diagram with something going on. 
Is that meant to be a circle? I'm not sure. Okay, so that is in fact a circle, uh, and it probably is a circle, but it optical illusions are making it look very non-circular, um, which is quite fun. All right, the shaded region is bounded by the circumference of the circle and the arc with center A joining B and C. The area of the shaded region is equal to half the area of the circle. Show that, etc. So, what we want here is to work with areas and base this off of our angle theta. Um, what you can do with your area formulae is you know the uh, the area for an arc for the uh, segment of a circle, which is what a b a to b to c back to a is, right? So this is the area of a segment of a circle with an angle of two theta. Um, you've also got areas with your radius r, um, and then do you have a formula for the area of these chords? Yes, yeah, see, so no? Yeah. Okay, so the first part you actually mainly want to be doing using the, uh, using the angles and such. Um, They've, they have some slightly curious. Okay, um, yeah, there's a lot of formulas that they want you to apply here. Um, the keys that you want to be looking at are A, what we were talking about, i.e. the area of a uh, segment of a circle, right, where you've got R and uh, the radius and theta. The other part is recognizing what you're doing with A and B and C. And the idea that if you extend this, this here, A to O and to the other side of the circle is a um, is a diameter of the circle. And if you extend that to B, then you're subtending an angle from the diameter of a circle. And so you know that this is going to be 90 degrees. So then you've got a right angle triangle, and you know the length of this side, it's 2r, right, because that's just the diameter of the circle. And you've got an angle, and so you can get the length of this side, and you can say that 2r cos of theta is equal to a b. Um, so you've got that formula, you're combining that with the idea of working out the areas of your segments, and then you can start to work out the area of the shaded region. 
so yeah um Yeah, I've not done a good job of explaining that because I'm honestly not entirely sure what these formulas are that you're supposed to know and that you aren't supposed to know. Um, but yeah, I think those are those are the main parts that they want you to get after. And then I'm not sure. Yeah, so essentially what they want you to be combining is the area of this large segment. A to B through this arc to C, and then recognizing that also you've got two smaller segments. You've got the OB round to A and the OA round to C, which are of the same size. And then because these are all overlapping, you also need the area of these triangles. Um, so it's those, those sets of areas. It's a segment, the triangles, and then these two slightly smaller segments which you need to be working with. Um, you need the length of this side so that you can do the area of the triangles and you can do that with the area as, as a sine theta rule. Um, so these are all formulas that you know, area of a triangle, area of a segment of a circle, um, but it's about recognizing which segments to use and then how to combine all of those areas to make up the area of this shaded region. Um, it is definitely a tricky question. So yeah. All right. The second part is much easier. We have an iterative formula. We have a starting value. We put that into the right hand side. We get an answer out for the next value and we repeat until our third decimal place stops changing so that we know the two decimal places. Uh, certainly. Yeah. All right. Well, and actually, in this case, they ask for even more, so they want uh, they want four decimal places. So you need to show the third decimal place stops changing. Um, so yeah, all right. Moving on, question seven. Let f of x equal this thing. Uh, express f of x in partial functions. Uh, partial functions, partial fractions. Excellent. Good start. Um, so partial fractions. Yeah, aside from trying to factorize, essentially all you're doing is initially the best way to do it is, and I'm assuming it'll work out, just attempt having some, you know, a over x minus 2 plus b over x squared plus 3. Multiply them back together, equate the numerators with a and b. Uh, a will be multiplied by the second one, b will be multiplied by the first one find out what a and b are, and then you have f of x in partial fractions. Um, or if you have some other method, equally go with that. Hence obtain the expression for f of x in ascending powers of x up to and including the term in x squared. What this involves is taking your, so what you're looking for is something of a over x minus 2 plus b over x squared plus 3, right? Now at this point, once you've got these, you can treat 1 over x minus 2 and 1 over x squared plus 3 as your binomial expansions, right? They're both a binomial expansion to the power of minus 1. Um, depending on how you are comfortable doing it, you can turn them into uh, things of the form 1 plus u. So this one would become uh, 1 plus x minus 3 to the minus 1. And this one similarly would become 1 plus x squared plus 2 to the minus 1. And you can put that into your regular binomial formula, or you can do it in other ways that you are comfortable with. Um, but yeah, you're expanding this as a My apologies. You're expanding this as a binomial expansion to the power of minus 1 and looking for everything that gives you a term up to x squared. 
and then obviously multiplying that expansion by a and b in each case. Okay, question eight, you can't use a calculator. Um, one of the biggest points to make for this question is actually not related to the question itself, but to that statement. When they demand that you use, that you not use a calculator for a question in a calculator paper, so they know that you have a calculator on you, it's important more than any other time to uh, write out every single small step of your workings. You know, trivial though it may be, just because you need to show them that you did it and not just chucked it into a calculator and then tried to write some stuff down. Um, so yeah, because calculators can do um, imaginary number stuff now, or some, some kinds of Casio calculators can. So in theory, you could just plug things in and get the answer. So moving back, we have two complex numbers, u and v. They satisfy some equations. Solve the equations for u and v, giving the answers in the forms x plus i, y. So ultimately, all you are doing here actually is looking for, um, you're, you're solving simultaneous equations, right? The best way to do this is to convert u and v into the form x plus i, y straight away. Um, that is the way I would recommend doing this. So call u x plus i, y and v a plus i, b or something like that, right? Put them in and then equate real and imaginary for each side, right? That will give turn each of these equations into two very simple linear equations, okay? And at that point, you will have a set of equations that you can solve as simultaneous equations. So on this side, so if we say u, well, we said u equals x plus i, y, v equals a plus i, b, for instance, then this equation, equating reals, will give us x plus 2a equals 0 because there's no real on the right, and uh, y plus 2b equals 2, because the imaginary part on the right is 2. Do a similar thing on the left, uh, on, the, on the right, I'm, I'm left and right, they're basically the same thing, right? Yeah, absolutely, I'm talking sense. Do the same thing on the other equation, equating left and right real and imaginary, and you will get another two equations that you can solve, and, and two of them will have x and a in, two of them will have y and b in. You uh, actually know they won't, so because they've done nasty things, but yeah. You will have equations you can substitute in, and you can figure out what uh, u and v are. Four equations, four unknowns, you can solve that. On an argand diagram, sketch the locus representing complex numbers z satisfying z plus i equals 1, and the locus rep representing complex numbers w satisfying arg of w minus 2 equals 3 pi over 4. Find the least value of z minus w for points on these loci. So, we have an argand diagram. z plus i equals 1. Anytime you've got a modulus equals this, you have a circle. Right? Um, so this is a circle of radius 1 centered on the point uh, minus i. So that's a circle around this point here of radius 1. Argument of w minus 2, that is an angled line. 3 pi over 4 means it's angled like this. And then it goes through the point uh, w equals 2. So it's going to go through the point 2 over here and it's at an angle 3 pi over 4. You have a straight line, you have a circle, you want go a perpendicular line, a perpendicular to the straight line to the origin of the circle, you work out the length of that perpendicular, and then you subtract the radius of the circle, because the outer edge of the circle is obviously a distance, the radius away from the center. These questions are very common, uh, you, you get this particular question with a locus circle, a locus line, and then the least value of these points. 
I'm sure you're getting quite practiced at them at this point. Um, so yeah, if you aren't quite practiced at them, very much have a go at this and get used to it because they are quite common and it's definitely worth learning and practicing this particular type of question because they like it. Question nine, we have a vector question and we have points on a irregular tetrahedron. The point D lies on BC between B and C and is such that CD equals 2DB. Fair enough. Find the equation of the plane ABC, giving your answer in the form. So, ABC. We know the position vectors of A, B, and C. Um, there are various ways. Ooh. There are various ways that you can do this. Um, one of the best. I still don't know whether you're supposed to know how to do cross products or not, because the best way involves doing a cross product and finding the normal. But I'm not sure that you're supposed to know how to do that. So what do they recommend in their mark scheme? Okay, so there are various ways that you can do this. Um, the key principle lies in the idea of the normal to the plane. Um, so I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to briefly mention a couple of methods. So the ultimate idea, uh, I'm going to borrow some space up here. The ultimate idea when you have a plane is that we have a plane like this. and for any vector in the plane, it's at right angles to the normal to the plane. And the normal to the plane is some vector coming, coming out of the plane such that it's at a right angle to the plane. So any vector that is in the plane is at a right angle to that because it's coming out in a completely perpendicular direction to the plane. So if you take the dot product of the normal to the plane with any vector in the plane, it will get an answer of zero. OK? Your normal vector to the plane will have some vector components such that it's A, B, and C. So then if you have a vector in the plane, you know that A times X, the vector, for the vector in the plane. If the vector in the plane is x, y, z, like usual, then ax plus by plus zz equals zero, because your dot product multiplying each of the same components is equal to zero. That's the key idea. Now, you can find, and, and that will give you an equation for x, y, and z, right? Um, if you know the normal directly, then you can actually get ax plus by plus cz equals zero for d. But, you know, you don't always have to get that. Um, there are equivalent things. Uh, the key idea here that you can use is that... Well, so that there are two ways. You can find the, try and find the normal directly. You can do that with cross products. Taking the cross product of any two vectors in the plane will give you a perpendicular vector 
which is the normal to the plane. Um, if you are comfortable doing that, that is an excellent way of doing it. Otherwise, what you can do is take any two vectors in the plane. So for instance, AC or AB for your plane ABC. And then you can imagine dotting them with this vector, this normal vector that you don't know. So you know the vectors in the plane, and if you take a couple of vectors in the plane, dot them with the normal vector and say, well, that must be equal to zero, you start being able to get a set of equations for your normal vector. And you will be able to define it down to some ratio of a to b to c, and then you get to pick what absolute value you want to have. And you will be able to turn that into this form. Um, so yeah. Find the position vector of D. Um, that one is not too bad. You look, it's along the line BC, so you want the vector BC, um, and then it's a third of the way from B to C. So if you take the vector C, uh, C minus B, that's this vector here. You add a third of that to B, and you've gone from here a third of the way along to D and you get the position vector of D. Show that the length of the perpendicular from A to OD, so from A here to this line here, dotted line, is one third the square root of 65. So, there are ways you could do this. Um, again, let's see. What did they recommend? Yeah, so assuming that you ignored trying to do some vector products and things like that, um, They want you to work with projections. Uh, that's obvious. Um, yeah. So the key idea here is that we we want this this line. Um, I've drawn it going along that same line. It doesn't. Um, that's that's just pure coincidence. And we want it such that there's a right angle by here. Um, you could try and work in the plane ODA. Um, that would work out fairly well. Uh, you can also just look for, essentially look for vectors that are um, perpendicular to OD. Yeah, look for a vector that's perpendicular to OD and lies in the plane ODA. Um, that's prob and, and then find the line that goes through A. That's probably how I would do it, but uh, yeah. I don't think I see any particularly easy way of doing this, so I think I will leave it at that to whichever method you, pr you desire. Um, yeah, there are a variety of methods, but I don't think any of them are particularly easier than the rest. So I think I will leave that one up to whichever way you decide to do it. All right, last question. We have a cone. We have a tank containing water in a cone, the axis is vertical, etc. A tap at sea is open and water begins to flow out. So, uh, dh by dt. Um, the volume of water in the tank decreases at a rate proportional to the square root of h, where h is the depth. The tank becomes empty when t equals 60. So the key to this first part is talking about the volume. Um, so this is the volume 
as proportional to uh, the side lengths, right? So volume of a cone, you can uh, work out. You have a formula for that. Um, I think it's a third h pi r squared, something like that. Um, yeah, something like that. Um, the key that you are looking for is the idea that h is proportional to the volume. Um, so in this case, yeah, the, vol the volume goes with h. Does it? That doesn't seem quite right. Oh dear, I'm getting myself very confused now. The volume should go with h. Um, Oh, right, yes. Oh, there we, there we go. Okay, right, I'm making a little bit more sense to myself now. So, the very first thing you need to do is work out the volume, which I should have done, is work out the volume as a function of h. And you can do this because you know the angle of the cone, right? Which means you can work out what the radius is as a function of h. Because it's 60, uh, you can do tan or sine or whatever and what do you end up with 2h something like that um, but yeah so you can work out the radius as a function of h and then you can work out the volume as a function of h and what you will get is that the volume is proportional to h cubed because it's proportional to the radius squared times h but the radius is itself proportional to h. So the volume is proportional to h cubed. We've said that dv by dt goes with the square root of h. If that, and then you can say, well, okay, but dv by dt is dv by dh, dh by dt, uh, for instance. So you can convert this into dh by dt. And dv, well, you have v as a function of h, so you can do dv by dh. Once you've got dv by dh, dh by dt, you've got an equation in terms of h, dh by dt and some functions of h. You can put that all on one side and you will get your answer. Um, so yeah that should all work out pretty reasonably in the end. Um, yeah. Also worth noting, my apologies, dv by dt goes with actually minus the square root of h uh, because the volume is decreasing at a rate proportional to h, so dv by dt is negative. Solve the differential equation given in part i. So here now we have a nice simple differential equation, right? There is, there are no t's in it, in fact. So we can just do separation of variables. We bring the h over to one side. We get the integral of h to the th 3 over 2. That looks horrible, but there we go. dh is equal to the integral of minus a dt. Both of those integrals you can do. You get a plus c on one side, which you can fix using h equals zero when tank becomes empty, that's h equals zero when t is 60. So you can fix your plus c constant and you've solved the differential equation. Uh, and then you have your equation for h and t. So if you put a half h into your uh, equation, you find t in terms of your capital H. So yeah.
All right. That seems fairly reasonable. So, uh, hopefully, aside from the uh, slight blathering at some points when I wasn't sure what I was doing, and I do apologize for that, um, but yeah, hopefully this was fairly helpful to you, and uh, yeah, I will see you again next time, I suspect.